to what? Hey, do you need a great life? God cares about you, and he does desire for you to have an awesome life. We're going through this study of Hebrews. Uh, it's broken into three parts. Jesus Christ, the first four chapters. The second five chapters, six chapters, is him crucified, his work. And then the application of faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. So this can happen. Listen up. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, here's the cool part for you, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let it be. You got to catch this series. God bless. What is of value in our life? And uh, the things that you treasure is where your heart is, right? And, and so, and you can go the other way. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure is as well. So our heart uh, evaluates and it takes and it, and it desires uh, to, to have. And uh, so we need to evaluate uh, the things that are precious. Tonight, I want to talk about what's most precious to you. What is most precious to you? And um, with that, I, I, want, I want to come on a, what God sees as most precious. And we've been uh, going through uh, Hebrews. And can somebody tell me uh, what was precious to the Jews um, at the time of Jesus to a certain extent? And, and, and uh, even before that, they sort of, uh, if they were godly, they were hanging on to this very strongly. Can somebody tell me what was uh, precious to, to the Jews uh, of their... Their law, the law, what they had in the law. So, sorry? We're going to get to it. So, the law. So, they had the, the law, which was given uh, in the Old Testament. And the law was given by who? Was it by Moses? Who gave the law? It was God. God gave the, gave the law to the, the children of Israel. Uh, does anybody know when that happened? When, when did the law, when did he give the law? So after they had left the, uh, Egypt and being slaves for 400 years, the, uh, the law was given to them uh, on a mountain and from a mountain. And uh, Moses uh, went and received that, that law. And by it, there was instruction given to, this is what you need to do. It's good to have instruction as what we should do, and especially when it comes to God. And um, so they, the law was very important to them. And with the law, what came along with the laws or the laws that God gave? What came along with that? There, was, there were f festivals, there were sacrifices that was put in place again by God. So... The last few weeks, we've gone over uh, chapters 1 through 11, and this is not an in-depth, but gives you an overview of Hebrews. And here, the writer, and we're not sure who it is, uh, possibly Paul. I would like to think it was Paul. And he's, as he's writing to the Hebrews, he's saying, listen, you esteem... Moses, you esteem, you, you, you look highly at, at Moses. And uh, 
And the writer is saying, but Jesus is preeminent. He is above Moses. And the second part, and there's three main parts to Hebrews. The first part is talking about what is or who is above all. And uh, we came to see, and as you read through chapters 1 to 4, you will find that Jesus is above all. He is above all. The Jews did not, had not accepted Jesus as the Messiah, and the writer is saying, Jesus is above all. And even as they held on, as the Hebrews held on, the Jews held on to their, their, their festivals, even to this day, even to this day, they, uh, although they don't have the sacrifices, they keep the different festivals throughout the year for those that are, are Orthodox Jews and those that are dedicated Jews to, to God. They keep the things of the Old Testament, the festivals that are given there. And so uh, the second part is all about chapters 5 through 10 talk about the different things that were instituted with The old, in the Old Testament, in Exodus and in Leviticus, all the different things that were put into place. And it had to do with the sacrifices. And all of the sacrifices of, of sheep, of lambs, uh, of bulls. We're talking male bulls, one year of age, rams or sheep, one year of age, male, and uh, turtle doves, depending on whether you were wealthy or not so wealthy, uh, they would have these different sacrifices. Burnt offerings every day. There was peace offerings, sin offerings, trespass offerings. There was a wave offering. All these different offerings, four out of the five having to do with actual animals being sacrificed. And these verse, these chapters, they deal with the fact that Jesus' sacrifice was above all the sacrifices, and it was once and for all. And the sacrifices ended with, or should have ended with Jesus. And as we believe in Jesus, he is the Lamb of God that was slain for us, is above all. Now, um, in chapter 11, uh, if I could have somebody read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. If somebody can read that short uh, verse. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Someone got it? All right. So now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so we went into that in depth last time. And uh, it's faith as we take uh, and apply faith in Jesus Christ who is above all and his sacrifice, his death for us being above all, uh, now there's an ap applying of the faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified, even though most of the people that are mentioned here in chapter 11 were before the cross. They, they were looking towards the cross that had not happened yet, um, and so, by faith, and we see that just in chapter 11, we see that faith is used, the word faith is used 23 times in one chapter. And the practicality of faith in daily life. And it's amazing that uh, we have miracles that are wrought by faith. And the miracles, 
we, uh, we read through them, we're, we're talking about amazing things that were done by faith. Ultimately, by faith, we have a conclusion that comes in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. If I could have somebody read Hebrews 13, 20, and 21. Hebrews 13, 20, and 21. And this is the, if I apply faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for, for me, this is what will happen, all right? Somebody have that? Yeah, through the blood. Okay. All right. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, there is this thing of a concluding of peace with God, the God of peace, uh, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead. The fact that Jesus Christ died, he is the great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, the fact that it is by his blood, his broken body, shed blood, that there is a covenant, a testament, a new and everlasting uh, uh, testament and will that is there for us. And he, as we place our faith there, it's, he says he will make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. And amen. How many of you believe that God has a specific plan for you? Every single one of you, doesn't matter what age, doesn't matter what background, every single one of you God has a purpose and a plan that is specific to you, and he desires to make you complete in every good work or action, every step you take to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. So he is going to do a work on you if you let him, if you surrender to him, if you let him. Lord, let your will be done in, in, my, in your uh, in, my, in my life, let that working in, in me, let it be done what is well-pleasing in your sight through Jesus Christ, that he would receive all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, so he assists us, he perfects us in every action, every communication, Every thought, every intention, every motivation, the Lord Jesus desires uh, to help us by his spirit as our faith is in Jesus Christ and his finished work for us. Now, um, so as was read earlier, faith is the substance of things hoped for. That foundation, this word substance is a foundation of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, things that will be put into place that we don't know yet, but they're being put into place as our faith is in that foundation of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. Now, we go to chapter 12. And um, in chapter 12, there are, it starts off with one word, can somebody tell me, what is the word that is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1? Maybe, maybe we can put that word or that, that up on the screen. Hebrews 12, verse 1. What is, what is the first word at the top? Therefore. Okay, therefore. Does anybody t can somebody tell me uh, in school... Uh, when when did you when do you use the word therefore? And it's not necessarily just in in English and language, but you would use this 
therefore, at what point or what, what subject perhaps? When you're coming to a summation, another word for summation, a conclusion, you're coming to a conclusion and for instance, when you're uh, trying to uh, calculate uh, different letters uh, in a, an equation and you don't have all the numbers and you're trying to find out, you remember that? So some of you that are in high school, uh, what is that called when you're figuring out a, trying to find a, uh, anyways, solving, right, solving for a, a, an equation, solving an equation. So anyways, there's this aspect of therefore, therefore. So if A is equal to 5 or whatever, then it, it solves the equation, all right? Therefore. In science, can somebody tell me when, when do we use th therefore? When, do we, when will we use that word? Or if you took science? I know, okay, for some of you, it's been a long time. I, I get it, I get it. So some of you students right now, when you're doing, if you're doing a, a science experiment, what's, what's the last part of a science of experiment if you're doing an experiment? Yeah, so a conclusion, in conclusion or therefore, this is the, the summary of the whole thing. All right, so there's a conclusion. You're summarizing the experiment. At the front of, or top of an experiment, a sci scientific experiment, there's a hypothesis. I think that this, if, I, if we do this, let's try to figure this out. And so we go through the experiment, and there's a uh, procedure that you go through to try to solve the, this hypothesis that you might have. All right, you're trying to figure something out. And you come to a conclusion in your experiment. That's the thing about science and math, physics. Oftentimes there's a conclusion. There's a therefore. So you, it's a concluding. Now, I, I make that statement at this point. There's conclusions that are being drawn from the first 11 chapters. There's conclusions... And it doesn't matter how, what age you are, whatever you are, there's conclusions that God has for our lives around those opening chapters. The first four being Jesus Christ. The next five chapters, six chapters being, and him crucified, his sacrifice. Chapter 11 has to do with the application of faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And now there are three therefores that are concluded in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, therefore, because of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and you have all these examples, you have these examples, therefore, the first therefore in Hebrews 12 verse 1, listen, it says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What race is that? What race is set before us? All right. Staying a Christian. It's the race of our life, the race of faith. And it says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, if you go over chapter 11, you will find that there are, I counted 34 names, including, I, I included where it says women. I also included where it said others, and where it says they, and where it says us. So there's 34 specific names, including these gen generalities of women, others, they, and us. And so at this time, 
of all the people that ever existed on this planet from beginning to end. I don't know how many there might be, but let's say there's, there's a billion people that have made it from time, from time when time began till now, that there might be, say, a billion people that made it to be with God. Let's just say a billion. They're in heaven. They are witnesses. They, that, that is this great cloud of witnesses. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, in other words, they made it. The chapter before is talking about all those that made it. They made it to existence with God for eternity. And it says, therefore, because by faith, and it says again, by faith, by faith, Abraham, or by faith, Moses, or by faith, goes through all these different names. By faith. They made it, and there, so God is saying to us, you can make it as well. Let us lay aside every weight. And so the ones that made it, they put aside. They hadn't arrived yet. They weren't perfect, but they put aside the things that would keep them from making it, from finishing that race of endurance that is set before us. All of us, we, we are going through life, and there's, we're, we're on this course until we die. Or the Lord comes back, one or the other. This, this week, I was at a, a celebration of life. So I was officiating this celebration of life. 85 years old, Alzita, Maria's mother, passed away on last Thursday, early in the morning at 8.25, 26. Her last breath. She's with the Lord. Her faith was in Jesus Christ. Last year, I found out, as I talked to uh, Maria, her daughter, one of her daughters, last year, she had, at 84 years of age, had been baptized in uh, Lake Erie. At 84 years, making a public confession of her faith. 84 years of age. And a year later, she is with the Lord, I just say, thank you, Lord, to, to put aside the weights. It says here, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the ones that made it, let us lay aside every weight. This is part of the concluding of what they did. They, they put aside the weights of life, and they didn't allow the weights of life to, to interfere with their faith. We can't allow the weights, the weighty things of life to interfere with our, our, our faith. And I see that happening. Oftentimes, we're distracted because of the weights of life, the cares of this life. Sometimes there's other things that, that interfere with us. Today, I'm talking about what is most precious to you. What is your, your faith? Is your faith... How precious is your faith to you? And I see at times where people, they, their, their faith becomes secondary to the weights of life. And so the weights of life overwhelm them and distract them from where they should be at in this run of endurance. And they're overcome by the, the weights of life. What's the second thing that's, that's mentioned in that first verse that, talks about therefore what's another thing that causes issue in hebrews 12 verse 1 it says let us lay aside not just the weights but the sin which so easily ensnares us and so you might find yourself you say oh my goodness there's stuff in my life that that it, it seems to to chain me or I, I get distracted and I, I, I grab a hold of these, these sins. Even in the chapter before, it says Moses. He said, it says, 
he gave up the pleasures of sin and the temptations that he had being in the palace of Pharaoh. Here he was. They were going to kill all the children under the age of two because Israel, the, the Jews who were in captivity, what was the issue? Why, were, why did they, why was the Pharaoh uh, wanting our, to kill all the, the boys under the age of two? Why? It was the population back then. Don't get it mixed, mixed with uh, Herod, King Herod at Jesus' time. This is Moses. So the reason uh, Pharaoh killed, was killing the boys under the age of two, was because the, the numbers of the, the slaves was just exploding. I guess, hey, you know, you, 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 you figure, hey, after a long day of labor and whatever, so it's like, hey, how much, how much activity can we have at this point in time? And there's, there's one child after another after another born. And so they went from 75 at the time that, that Abraham died, uh, or sorry, uh, Jacob died, from 75 we're probably in four, within 400 years around two to three million people. And so they were, Pharaoh was saying, hey, we got to get rid of these children because they're going to overtake us. If they choose to rebel, they, they can overcome us because they're, they're, their population is way bigger. So there was this thing of killing the children. And here, that's where Moses, how Moses got into the uh, the palace, because his mother and father saw that he was, says he was a beautiful child, and they didn't want him to die, so they put him, they made a, a basket, and they put him in the Nile River, and they pushed him out, knowing that that, that baby, or hey, is in, the, in God's hands, but Pharaoh's daughter saw this child, and took this child in, took Moses in, and Moses gave up the, the pleasures and all the things of, of distraction, if you would, of, of wealth and power and authority that he could have had as, as growing up. He gave it all up, even though of the, the pleasures that were there. And so it says, by faith, by faith he did this. By faith, knowing what is and was to come, maybe not to the extent that we, do, we know, but their faith was in God and this thing of the promised land. Even it says Joseph, when he died in Egypt, says, listen, I want you to promise that you're going to take my bones out. When you go back to the promised land, you get out of the slavery, take my bones with you. That's exactly what happened. 400 years later, they took the bones of Joseph with them according to what he had, had spoken by faith. He says, you take me back to the promised, the promised land. But there's this aspect of faith. So we let go of the sins which so easily ensnare us that would hold us back. If, if Moses would have stayed where he was at, he would not have been the man that he was to lead the people out of, out of bondage. Um, and yeah, even as a flawed man, somebody that had killed somebody else and he had to run and flee, the Lord used Moses. He, it says he was the most humble man that there was and he was used by God because of faith, by faith. It says that two or three times, it says what he did by faith. So it says these two things, to the weights that, so, that slow us down or would slow us down, get rid of them. The sins that so easily snare, ensnare us, let them go. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Don't be distracted from finishing the race. I think this is the problem oftentimes. I, I'm, I'm, the enemy will do whatever he can so that you don't finish the race, that you just your faith 
go shipwrecked. The second thing, the second verse says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Our faith is in him. What he did for us, let it be with him all along. When it comes to starting our lives, whatever age, again, whatever age we are at, and as we would, whatever time we come to the Lord, whether we're 84 years of age, when we come to the Lord or we make a public confession later on in our life, or whether we're young, we're children, we're teenagers, that there would be a looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He wants for us to hang on to our faith in him and what he did for us, to look to him. Now, it's interesting, with this therefore, there's a few, there's things that the writer inspired by the Holy Spirit, would have us consider. Look at verse 3. And uh, I'm going to try to make it through to verse 17 uh, before we finish. So don't worry, we'll, we'll move a little bit quicker now at this point. So th this, therefore, is for us. It says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. A lot of times say, man, I don't know if I can continue on in serving God. I don't know, man, life is so rough as a Christian, and I, I seem to be overwhelmed. I'm weary, I'm tired, and I'm discouraged. And he's, there's this thing of consider Jesus, look to Jesus, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, especially as you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Look to Jesus. Don't look to yourself. Don't look elsewhere. Don't look anywhere else. Look to Jesus when you are weary and discouraged. And there's this thing of, that's where I need to look. So often when a person is weary and discouraged, they start looking to other solutions. I guess God's not going to come through for me. Look to Jesus. This thing of making it to the end. Don't, don't stop I can remember with the long-distance races, I was coaching long-distance runners, whether it was cross-country or the 3,000-meter uh, or the 1,500-meter. The thing that got me, even though the kids, and it didn't happen often, there was maybe a few that would stop and they would not finish the race. And it was like, just finish. And you're, like they're so close to the finish line. And, and sometimes they're discouraged because maybe they were the last one in or whatever. But finish the race. Just finish the race. And it's so, as a person is discouraged, I don't know if I can finish the race. And so sometimes it was the cheers from the witnesses on the side or even the cheers, or the cheer and the encouragement from the coach on the sideline. You can do it. Finish the race. Finish the race. You can make it. Look to Jesus when you are weary and discouraged. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. You didn't, you haven't gotten to the point yet where you're dying for your faith. Now, there are some that die for their faith. Because of this, I'm, even if it costs me my life, for the most part, we don't get to that point where it's going to cost us our, our life physically. But it may cost us our lives, or it costs us our lives if we don't finish the race. So, Look to Jesus and realize that Jesus, he's the one that died for you to help you through the hardship or the, the, the fact that I, I need to endure to the end.
There's something about the finish line that you realize, okay, I don't have that much further to go. I'm going to finish the race. It says in verse 5, it says, it talks about the fact, and this is another point here, when it comes to things to consider. Not, don't just consider Jesus, to look to Jesus when you're weary and, dis, uh, and discouraged. Not just realizing that Jesus died for you to help you. He went through things just like you and I, and he overcame, and he is there to help us to overcome. But realize that we are children of God. He says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which says, which speaks to you as to sons. You're a child of God. You are a son. You are a daughter of the Most High God because you receive Christ into your life. Now listen to the next part here. Because it's like, oh, I don't know if I can, like why? Why this verse, the next two verses? It says, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens or disciplines and scourges every son whom he receives. Like we're talking discipline. We're talking correction. So God chastens. He corrects. He scourges every son whom he receives. Don't be discouraged. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. The things that we experience, some of them are the chastening of the Lord. Why would God chasten us? Exactly. The reason there's a, a correction, the correction is get back on track, get back into the game, or not into the game, get back into the race. Don't give up. Get back into the race. And so there's this chastening, this correcting. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. So this thing of even not despising the chastening of the Lord. It's, it's about our attitude. What attitude do we have when things aren't going the way we want or even God is, is chastening us, correcting us? It says, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. In other words, have the right attitude. Don't be discouraged when corrected by the Lord. Don't be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Because, listen to verse 6, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. The reason that he's correcting you is because he loves you. I don't know if you, there's that saying uh, from parents to their children, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Right? He said, yeah, right. Yeah, sure. The thought is, yeah, sure, it's going to hurt you more than it hurts me. But to be in a position of a, of a parent, this thing of correcting your child is, you, we need to correct our, ch our children when they're going off course, when they're going to uh, uh, hurt themselves. And so there's this correction that takes place. And so that we have the right atti attitude. Don't be discouraged when corrected by the Lord because... For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he corrects. Allow the Lord to correct you because he loves you. He's correcting your faith. There's a correction in your faith. What are you going to trust in? The correction is in the faith. I had a phone call today, and it was like, wow. Wow. That was an interesting last week or an interesting few days that this individual had. Part of it, I'm, I'm wondering, Lord, was this, some of this was a correction on your part, chastening on your part? There's another call. I had two calls today, another call yesterday, different call. Two of them were related. And there's chastening. I'll tell you right now, I know that it's 
chastening of the Lord. Chastening of the Lord. And so the consequences are extreme. Why? Because the individual thinks, I I'm fine. I'm fine. I know about God. I gave my life to Jesus a long time ago, and I know things about Jesus, and I know the Word to a certain extent. And, uh, but I can go ahead and continue to do the things that I, I want to do that are wrong and think that I'm going to be okay. And so now the Lord is, there is correction and chastening taking place because the Lord is saying, that's not the case. If you don't smarten up and there's a rebuking by the Lord and allowing for things to happen to get that person in a place to say, you cannot continue doing what you're doing. Now recognize, this is a chastening of the Lord. So tomorrow I'm going to see that person. I'm going to go see that person. I say, listen, I'm, I'm going to, I know the Holy Spirit is going to give me wisdom in dealing with them in love, to deal with the individual in love. But just say, hey, what do you think that you're doing that is not right before the Lord? You tell me. Has the Holy Spirit convicted you? Because oftentimes the Holy Spirit comes to convict, and there's a conviction. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And there's a continuation on. And we think, well, you know what? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a believer. I'm going to be okay. And I continue doing the things that I know that I shouldn't do. And there's a chastening because the Lord loves you, and He's saying, you've got to get it right. You've got to get it right. If you don't change these things, I, I use the phrase walking backwards into, into hell. I walk, walk backwards into hell. I'm looking to Jesus, I'm looking to the cross, and I'm hanging on to things that I know. I'm doing things. This, we're, we're talking about doing things that, I, that we know we shouldn't, and where there's a practice of it, we're doing it again and again, and the Holy Spirit is convicting, stop, stop. And the, the, the chastening becomes more extreme. Why? Because God loves you. The Lord doesn't want the death of a sinner, but that they should come to repentance, that there would be a correction that takes place. Why? Because the most valuable thing is your, your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. Don't let go of it. And it's almost like, you know what? I'm going to give, I'm going to give who, Jesus and what he did for me on the cross. I'm going to give it up. I'm going to hang on to things that I shouldn't be hanging on to. Actions that I shouldn't be hanging on to. Thoughts, attitudes, intentions, motivations that are not right. It says, nor be... Do not be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens or corrects and scourges every son whom he receives. He disciplines. Why? Because he loves. I want you to make it. Now listen, verse 7. If you endure chastening, if you get through it, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, you've all been chastened, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So if, the God, if God would not deal with us, you say, oh, yeah, you do whatever you want. I don't care. We're already in a bad place. We don't belong to him anymore. The thing is to endure chastening, to receive that correction that God has for us because we do belong to him. We are children of his, and the Lord loves you. And even in the chastening, we recognize this, this thing of his love for us and the fact that his, our faith in Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, don't let go of it. It says, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. And I would say respect God in the correction, in the chastening, in the disciplining. Respect God. Sometimes I've, I've heard people say some horrific things because they're, they're going through whatever, and they're struggling, and you know what? They say, I'm done. They, they give up. And some of the things, the disrespect 
to God in sending his son. I, I love you so much. He sent my son that died for you and took all your sins upon himself so that you can have life and there's a disrespect. Watch your attitude. Watch your thoughts. Watch your actions. Watch your words towards God. Furthermore, we ha have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? The Father of spirits. You are alive because you received Jesus into your life the moment you gave your life to him. To be in subjection. You might say, does anybody, well, does anybody know what subjection means? To be in subjection to somebody? What does it mean, subjection? Okay, to do what they say or obey. If we subject or some ourselves to someone, we would obey them. Yeah, okay, something else? To subject that how much or shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? He's saying it's, it's a rhetorical question. It's of course if we're in subjection to the Father of spirits, we'll, we'll have life, we'll live. What's another word for, or what could be another thing, thought around subjection, to subject? Sorry? Under somebody's authority? Yeah, absolutely. We put ourselves, we subordinate ourselves under somebody, okay? Something else? Sorry? Okay, obedience, yeah. So this Greek word, actually, um, it's, it means also to submit to one's control, is subjection, to yield to one's admonition or advice. If we subject ourselves to somebody and they're giving us advice, I'm going to take heed to, I'm going to do that. I'm doing that. So we subject ourselves to the advice given in this case, subjection to the Father, God the Father, to, to be subject or obey. Now, it is this word here in the Greek is uh, hupo tazo or tazo or hupato, hupatazo. Anyways, probably putting the, the emphasis on the, the wrong uh, syllable. But it's a, it's a Greek word. It's a military term. Listen to me. It's a military term meaning to arrange troop divisions in a military fashion under the command of a leader. So in the Roman Empire, there was this, there was a hierarchy of, of submission and authority that you ranged yourself under. Can somebody give me the name of, of a man in the book of Acts that was in the military and his, his rank told you exactly what, how many men were under him. Okay, Cornelius the centurion. His rank was such that there was a hundred men. He had a hundred men, fighting men under him. There probably would have been a support group to the actual fighting men. I'm finding that out. With, uh, with Jacqueline in the military just for one helicopter or for a, a squadron of helicopters and for the, the pilots that are there to, f to fly these, these helicopters, there's probably about, s about six times, or there's 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 techs that are working for just 12 to keep 12 uh, aircraft flying. So you have techs. Now, of course, you work, they're working, uh, you know, continually. There's, ma there's uh, maintenance checks done. There's, if there's things breaking down, there's, they're fixing it. They're, they're working on it to keep these, these aircraft in the air, these machines in the air. And so there's this arranging of, in a military fashion, to arrange under the command of, of a leader, whatever that is. So whether 
for, for Jacqueline in, in the Air Force as an officer. She started at a, as a uh, second lieutenant, then became a lieutenant, and now is, is a captain. And the next would be major above. And it just, so there's a ranking that goes up. And so there's more responsibility. There's more seeing, overseeing. Now, in a non-military use, the word subjection has to do with a volu the voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. So if we're in the su subjection to the father of spirits and live, to live, there's a willingness I voluntarily give myself under, to be under. I give in, and I'm under the authority of God, cooperating. I assume responsibility. I carry a burden if need be. I'm in subjection to, this, to, to God who is chastening or correcting, rebuking, getting me back on track. So there's a getting back on track. So not only are we in subjection to the Father, it says here, for they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. May I say this? If you heed the correction and the chastening of God, just following his word, I'm going to subject myself to his word and to his command. It says here, that there's a profit in it for us. For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us. We're talking about our earthly fathers. As it seemed best to them, they did it to the best. How many of you were, were totally in agreement with the chastening you got by your parents? Because they got it right every single time. Yeah? Yep. My, my brother is just saying, yep, I, I'm in full agreement because my mother's sitting right in front of me. And she might turn around and give me a slap, you know. Um, but anyways. Um, we don't, uh, we, they did the best that they could. But when it comes to God, his chastening is always for our profit to get us back on track. Get your faith where it needs to be. Jesus Christ and Him crucified in my Son. The power and the wisdom of God is available. I want you to be right before me, that you would be partakers of His holiness. As we keep our faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, the holiness, the righteousness of Jesus is imputed upon us, and we are in right standing daily. We'll see this uh, in the next sentence. It says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Present. How many of you got a spanking and uh, you were really joyful about it, right? I, I don't think so. No chastening seems joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. In other words, I heed the correction that I'm getting. So I heed that correction it's painful in the moment, but I get it, Lord. So tomorrow when I go to see this individual, I, hadn't, I haven't seen him in a few years now. When I go to see him, part of it will be, hey, this, what's happening right now, learn from it. If you're trained by the correction, it'll be a profit to you, and it will bring the fruit of righteousness as you are trained by it. Now, this word righteousness, I love this definition. In, in a broad sense, as a whole covering, it's the state of the person who is as they ought to be. If you, if you have the righteousness of Christ in your life, you are as you ought to be because of your faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If your faith is in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, you are as you ought to be before God. Now, I know I haven't arrived yet. Paul says, I, I haven't apprehended yet, but I press on. But my faith, let our faith continue to be in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and we're surrendered to 
the lordship of Jesus Christ, this living sacrifice onto the Lord. I just give myself completely over to you. My faith is in you. And the next thing we know that we are, let me read again. It says, we, it yields, the correction yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those that have been trained by it. This fruit of righteousness that grows and is put upon us. I just say, thank you, Lord, for your righteousness. Let me be trained by your correction. Let me be trained. Therefore, it says, the second therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may be dislocated but rather so that what is lay may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. So it says, as you do these things, so the first thing, the first therefore is, hey, let me finish the race. And there's all these different things. There may be corrections and course corrections on the way. And if I heed this thing, now it's saying, therefore, the hands that hang down, it's like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't think I can make it. I don't know if I'm going to be there or, or go through it says, make straight the paths for your feet. So we're not going here, there, all over the place. Like I see some people, it's like here, there, and everywhere. And there's this thing of making straight the paths for your feet. So that what is lame, if you were lame and I wasn't walking properly, now I'm walking right. I'm walking by faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. And there's a healing that's taking place in my existence, in my being as I'm put back on track by the, our Heavenly Father correcting us. I say, thank you, Lord. I get my faith back to where it needs to be. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk also in the Spirit. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. It says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Yes, we should pursue peace peace with all people, but not at the expense of holiness. Yeah, I'll have peace if you, you know, want. I can have peace with so-and-so if I, I, I do like they're doing. We only have holiness through Jesus Christ and what he did for us. If my faith isn't something else, I am negating the power of the cross available to me. It has no effect. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest, any, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To make the cross of Christ to no effect. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, they don't make it. Looking carefully. Look. This word means to look, to inspect, to oversee, to look after, to care for your faith. Let your faith be in the right thing. Let it inspect. Where am I at? Examine. Where am I at? What is, what is most precious to me? I got other things that are more precious than my faith in Jesus Christ. I need, I need to make some shifts in my, my, my priorities. If your faith is not in the right thing, it says here, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. And so when my faith is not in the right thing, there is, and I, I fall short of the grace of God, and now this root of bitterness starts to grow within me, causing defilement a pollution, a polluting of my being, a contaminating of my being, a soiling of my being. This is what this word defiled means, to defile with sins. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, if it comes by me trying to keep the law, then Christ died in vain. Listen to what it says about Esau. Verse 16, Hebrews 12, 16. Lest there be any fornicator who prof 
or profane person like Esau who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. What's a birthright? There's an inheritance for which, for which individual? The right or advantages of the firstborn son. And he gave it up. He gave it all up. Just, hey, Jacob had made some soup. Some awesome soup. Uh, Jacob, can I have some of that soup? No, you can't. Oh, come on. Give me your birthright. Oh, okay. Here, I give you my birthright. I'll take the soup. It says here, this is a profane person that gives up their birthright in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, gives it up. That's a profane person. Because they don't value, they, he did not value the birthright. The sad thing is, it says here, for the, you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. So he wanted to ha inherit the blessing and the, the birthright. He was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. There was no repentance. He didn't change his ways, even though he wanted the blessing. And we want, we want to have the blessing, but we don't necessarily want to repent. And this repentance is a turning. I need to turn back to what my faith should be in. And if I don't, I lose out. So what is the value of your faith? What is the value of your faith to you? Listen to, listen to the value. So up until now, we've been talking about God chastising and correcting to get you back on, on track so that you can be moving forward in all power and not, to, he's saying, to lift up the hands that hang down. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may be not be dislocated but rather be healed. I want there to be he healing. As you grab a hold of your faith and hang on to your faith, you will be healed. You will be able to move forward. What is the value of your faith? This is what God says. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, 1 Peter 1, 6, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How genuine is your faith in Jesus Christ and crucified? Am I going to give it up when things become difficult? in the trials. And here God is saying, there, let there be a testing that if there is something that is not there that, or there's something there that should not be, uh, belong, let it come out in the testing by trial. What is my faith in? This trials are a good thing to test our faith. What is it in? Am I going to give up my faith? We say, no, I'll never give up my faith. And Peter, in the first moment where there was testing, and he says, I don't even know Jesus. He'd been with Jesus for three and a half years. I don't know Jesus. I wasn't with him. Three times before the rooster crowed, I heard the rooster. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. This salvation of our souls, the prophets have inquired. They were asking and searching carefully, what is it exactly like? The Old Testament prophets, they did not know what we know now to the extent that we know now. And they searched diligently who prophesied the grace that would come to, to you. There was grace coming. They prophesied of it, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow, knowing that Jesus or there would be a Messiah coming that would, would die and there would be glories that would follow. And so they're looking into this, 
To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So they were, they were speaking of it. They had already long, been long dead already, and they were looking forward to Jesus coming. And now, as Paul is writing here, or Peter is writing, I'm preaching the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And now, now here it talks about angels, things which angels desire to look into. The faith, the thing of faith that we have, the prophets were wondering what it was going to all look like. The angels even now are looking at us and they're marveling at the thing of faith and the salvation that comes by faith, the goodness of the Lord that comes by faith. And they marvel, they look at it. Can we stand together? Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What is the value of your faith? What is the value of your faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Is it just, I oh, yeah, I hear Pastor Dave, he talks about it often. Or is it, oh my goodness, thank you, Jesus, that you came. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. Thank you, Jesus, that I have life. I have forgiveness of sins. I have life in and through you. I thank you, Jesus, for my faith. In you, I thank you for what you did for me because you love me and what you want to do in my life on me, through me. Lord, have your way. And Lord, that it would not just be about me, but that it would be about others. Lord, that I can share what I have with others. Lord, I just pray right now. Lord, that the faith, that we would recognize what we have. So often we underestimate our salvation, how we came to a place of salvation it was by faith in you, in your finished work. And we underestimate the value of our faith. And Lord, I just pray that as that faith is maybe we, we, we lose interest or we, the value, something else comes in its place that we would say, well, this is more important to me. Lord, I pray that there would be all chastisement of you take place. Let, the, let there be correction to get us back on track. Because who you are, what you did for us is the most important thing, the, the single most important thing that we could have on this side of heaven. Lord, when we, when we face death, the, the, the things that we may have acquired of wealth, and of, of material things, Lord, become very insignificant in the face of death. Lord, the most precious thing is our faith in you, what you did for us on the cross, because in it is life, in it is righteousness, in it is salvation, in it is the, the things of holiness, in it, in it is eternity wait, awaiting us, Lord. So, Lord, I just pray. As we are, our, our faith is tested, the genuineness of our faith is tested. Lord, let the declaration be, Lord, my faith is in you. My faith is in your finished work. Lord, let us cling to this. Let everything else that would interfere, the weights of life, the distractions of sin that ensnare us, Lord, let us let them go in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for my dear brothers and sisters, Lord, that we would walk in a way that is pleasing before you and that we would bring others to that way, to that place of right standing with you. Lord, as we tell them about you, Lord, let us proclaim your name and your, your, your act of love for us, Lord, on that cross.
to take care of our sins and to bring us life. Lord, I just pray, let us declare it at this time. Lord, with the time that we have left, in Jesus' name, bless my dear brothers here tonight, those that are listening online now. Lord, I just pray, speak into their hearts. Let them finish the race well, that we would finish the race well. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God. Hey, guys, it's Matt. I really hope you enjoyed that sermon today. If you'd like to check out more of them, they're going to be here and here. Have a great day. God bless.